Believe me, lords, my tender years can tell. Civil dissension is a viperous worm that gnaws the bowels of the Commonwealth. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Ear Read This, a podcast providing critical introductions to our favourite works of literature. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'm talking about Henry VI, Part 1, by William Shakespeare. You might remember that Henry V ended with that epilogue dampening the king's triumph in France with news of his forthcoming death, and it went on to mention the story of his son, Henry VI, which oft our stage hath shown. This is, of course, because Shakespeare tackled the chronologically later kings first. We've been looking at the plays in king order, as opposed to composition order. Richard II, the two parts of Henry IV, and Henry V were written as Shakespeare was entering his pomp. Interspersed among those celebrated histories are plays like Romeo and Juliet, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and The Merchant of Venice. Following Henry V, Shakespeare would go on a winning streak of As You Like It, Julius Caesar, and Hamlet. But today, as we move forward in time with the kings, we move backward in time with the playwright. As far back, perhaps, as his very beginnings, for there are those that believe that today's play was his first. Before we get on to the special controversies of dating and authorship that invariably attend any Shakespeare play, let's just briefly set the scene. So in the wake of those famous victories of Henry V and his English band of brothers, Henry VI, part one, dramatises an abrupt decline in fortune, not only for the royal family, but England herself. The play opens with Henry V's funeral, and establishes that those lands he gained are being rapidly taken back by the French, who have found a remarkable new military leader in the Holy Maid, Joan of Arc. By the end of the play, the two nations have reached an uneasy peace, and meanwhile we have seen the rumblings of civil war in England. There is a rift in the Plantagenet family between the houses of York and Lancaster, prelude to the famous Wars of the Roses. The play takes place between the years 1422 and 1444, so if you're wondering why I haven't mentioned the titular king yet, it's because in 1422, Henry VI hadn't even turned one. To this day, Henry VI is the youngest person ever to take the throne. The Duke of Bedford and later the Duke of Gloucester ruled as regents of the realm, and along with the Earl of Warwick, the Bishop of Winchester and Richard Plantagenet, they dominate the political machinations in the play while Henry himself doesn't appear until the third act. Although he has more to do in parts two and three, like his grandfather before him, Henry is overshadowed in his own plays by more dominant characters, like his wife, Queen Margaret, the Duke of York, and his son, the future Richard III. Today's play is thought to have been first written and performed in around 1592, but it depends who you ask. Just so you know, the Shakespeare dates I use for all my podcasts are taken from the chronology given by the Penguin Shakespeare series, edited by Stanley Wells. This chronology agrees with scholars who say that part one was written and performed later than parts two and three. Sounds ridiculous at first, but it's important to remember that our modern way of titling these plays has created the sense of a Henry trilogy, which wasn't necessarily there to begin with. What we call parts two and three were originally called the first and second parts of the contention, placing emphasis on the division between the houses of York and Lancaster and away from the monarch himself. In fact, the splendidly long title to the second part, which we'll discuss next time, name checks the Duke of Gloucester, the Duke of Suffolk, the Bishop of Winchester, Jack Cade, and the Duke of York, without even mentioning the king by whom we refer to the play now. So I started laughing halfway through that because my script said the Duke of Gloucester. The parts one, two, three arrangement stems from Hemmings and Condell, those famous compilers of the first folio, where this play appears under the title The First Part of Henry VI. The parts one, two, three arrangement stems from Hemmings and Condell, those famous compilers of the first folio, where this play appears under the title The First Part of Henry VI. The 1592 dating for part one is conventionally reached as follows. It couldn't be earlier than 1587, because that was when Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles was first published. This, as we know, was a crucial source for all of Shakespeare's history plays. Nor could it be later than Thomas Nash's 1592 reference to Brave Talbot triumphing on the stage, a reference he makes in his prose work, Piers Penniless. To narrow the window further, many circle the entry in Philip Henslow's diary dated 3rd of March, 1592. It refers to a play called Harry the Sixth and is labelled Ne, N-E, which some read as New. 
Well, if it was a new play in March of 1592, surely, the argument goes, it was this play, part one. Because as we have seen, the second two parts were not referred to by Henry's name. So unless Henslow got his Henrys mixed up, or he was referring to a play now lost to us, he must mean this one. Now, E.K. Chambers was the first to suggest that today's play was written after its sequels, and his argument has attracted support from the likes of John Dover Wilson, C.A. Greer and R.B. McCarrow. McCarrow points out that if part two was written after part one, it seems utterly incomprehensible that it should contain no allusion to the prowess of Tolbert, who is this play's tragic hero, as we shall see. He also points out that the Lancastrian and Yorkist use of red and white roses features a great deal in parts one and three, but very little in part two, suggesting that one and three were written closer together, part two coming before Shakespeare hit upon the device. But ranged against this position are the formidable frowns of Dr. Johnson, Andrew Cairncross and E.M.W. Tilliard. Those in allegiance with them frequently cite the immaturity of part one as a good indicator of it coming first. It is full of battle scenes and violence. The physical spectacle Ben Johnson sneered at as being for the vulgar, who are better delighted with that which pleaseth the eye than contenteth the ear. Tina Packer goes as far as to suggest that Shakespeare began to write part one while still at school, when his enthusiasm for battle scenes would have been at its boyish peak. And Tilliard points out other characteristics of the juvenile Shakespeare, saying that in part one there are outbursts of the turgid or dulcet writing dear to the university wits. Playwrights like Marlowe and George Peel, who Shakespeare was known to imitate in his early career. Tilliard disapproves of these florid flourishes, but to part with them would be to lose moments like the French general at the gates of Bordeaux, calling Talbot thou foul and ominous owl of death. Until Tilliard's seminal study of Shakespeare's histories in 1944, the Henry VI plays had fallen out of favour. Critics like H.B. Charlton had decided that the whole matter of Henry VI has no dramatic form. There is no dominant interest, recognisable as dramatic interest, to hold the audience in continuous suspense. And it had by then become a common assumption that Shakespeare merely had a hand in these plays and had not authored them on his own. Those outbursts reminiscent of the university wits might not be Shakespeare emulating the likes of George Peel, but Peel himself, or Robert Greene, or Thomas Nash. Perhaps the Tamburlaine like Talbot might not be Shakespeare imitating his great rival Marlowe, but Marlowe himself reworking his own material. In fact, Gary Taylor has suggested that Shakespeare wrote precisely 18.7% of part one, with Nash, Green and Peel filling in the rest. Other scholars include Marlowe and Thomas Kidd in their lineup, a veritable who's who of Elizabethan playwrights. In 2016, it was announced that the new Oxford Shakespeare would accredit the writing of the Henry VI plays to Marlowe and Nash, and list Shakespeare as merely the humble adapter. After all, he was known to collaborate early on in his career, and some of the inconsistencies in the writing could be explained by the play having multiple hands. The bardolatry of some critics makes it hard for them to accept weaknesses in the play being attributed to Shakespeare. Anthony Quiller Couch, for instance, hoped that Shakespeare had no hand in the slanderous portrait of Joan of Arc, sent down to us under his name. But the play's racial slander is not unlike Shakespeare's treatment of the French in Henry V and Edward III, and this early in his career, as Tilliard points out, it is not in the least surprising if the style is hesitant and varied. A more instinctive defence of the plays being written in the simple 1-2-3 order has been that part one just sounds more auspiciously like a beginning than part two. The second part opens with Suffolk, recounting his mission to France and presenting Henry with his new queen, Margaret of Anjou. In simplistic, expository blank verse, he tells Henry what he already knows, while also refreshing the audience. As by your high imperial majesty, I had in charge at my depart for France, as procurator to your excellence, to marry Princess Margaret for your grace, and so on and so forth. By contrast, this first part opens thunderously. Hung be the heavens with black, yield day to night. Comets, importing change of times and states, brandish your crystal tresses in the sky, and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented unto Harry's death. Not only does this have the momentous crash of someone embarking on a grand series, but it contains thematic material we are now familiar with. It has that epic cosmic imagery we have been hearing since Richard II, which lets us know that once again the wheel of fortune has spun on, casting down Henry V and dredging up whatever devils have been lurking below. Now before you pick a rose and side with 
part one coming first or not, it's worth saying that all of the arguments I have mentioned should be modified by the likelihood that Shakespeare revised his early plays at a later date, perhaps adding in such thematic linkages, as well as reworking scenes and, who knows, maybe even retitling plays. But that doesn't, of course, mean that the three parts of Henry VI all sound the same. So I am really looking forward to going over each of them with you individually. This is probably the most ambitious run of episodes I've attempted, so I'm very grateful to be joined by not one, but two guests who are on very familiar terms with all three plays. The first voice you'll hear today is Hayley Backrack, a dramaturg, writer and critic who has recently worked on an adaptation of the Henry VI plays for Shakespeare's Globe. Also joining me is Owen Horsley, who along with Gregory Doran is directing a two-part adaptation of the plays for the RSC, scheduled for 2022. As usual, I will be releasing extended interviews with both Haley and Owen, in which they talk more about their own work and productions, and these will come out in between the episodes on the Henry VI plays. I am also delighted to have for the first time on the podcast an actual actor to perform some of the speeches from the plays instead of me. Over the course of the three episodes, you'll hear characters like King Henry, Queen Margaret and Richard III brought to life by Danielle Farrow. A huge thank you to all three contributors. You can find out more about them in the episode description box below. Now, in the first few minutes of this podcast, I've raised lots of unanswered questions about these plays. But one thing that seems certain is that despite their long hiatus from the stage, they seem to have been popular in their own day. And it was on this topic that I begun my interview with Hayley Backrack. Yeah, I think we have a lot of reason um, to think that they were. The fact that there are three of them is step one, an indicator of their popularity, probably. Um, We think, uh, most scholars now think that, just to keep it all nice and confusing, Henry VI Part Two was probably written first, Henry VI Part Three after that, and then the Henry VI Part One last. So it's sort of, oh, that went really well. We've had the sequel. Let's have the prequel too. So that is one hint that they probably uh, were quite successful. Um, The other thing that is probably an indication that they were fairly popular is this sort of famous first kind of written reference to Shakespeare as a writer that we have is Robert Greene or maybe not Robert Greene, maybe someone writing under a pseudonym of a person who existed um, has this pamphlet where he refers to this shake scene, new Mm. playwright, an upstart crow beautified with our feathers, he says, and he describes him as a tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide which is a reference to Henry VI Part III. Um, someone describes Queen Margaret as a tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide, which seems to indicate that people could read this quotation and know what it was from and know who, you know, understand, because he never says Shakespeare, mm. but it's also kind of, it's that, that the idea that that quote would help make clear who he was referring to suggests that the play had done quite well. People wouldn't be reading it and be like, I don't, understand what what are you saying you know yeah. it's it's something that he counted on as like I can I can use this as a hint to who I'm talking about and what I'm talking about so all these things together sort of suggest yes I think the plays were seem to have been quite successful um, and seem to have put Shakespeare on the map mm. to a certain extent as a writer it seems interesting yeah so we often read those references as if they're for us like there's a there's a sort of mystery to be solved but it's it's really interesting to reconsider them as it'll be very obvious who he was referring to to people of the time they they wouldn't have thought it was kind of cryptic yeah i mean it's hard you know who knows maybe it was a theater in joke and he knew that only people in the industry would get it mm. or maybe it was widely obvious but at any rate it was something that in trying to kind of allude to Shakespeare, he was like, this is the play I'll quote from, this is what's going to help me make my point. Peter Saccio writes, of Henry VI, it has been wittily pointed out that he is the only king of England to have been twice crowned, twice deposed, and twice buried. Given his tumultuous reign, he lived longer than you might expect, as these plays attest. They span almost 50 years. The contrast between Henry and his warrior king father is stressed as early as the first scene, the Duke of Gloucester calling him an effeminate prince. A little harsh, given Henry is historically only a few months old. But Gloucester is proved to have a certain gift of insight when it comes to infants. And when we first meet Henry VI, he is threatening sighs and tears if his warring uncles will not make friends. In performance, Henry is often played as weak, waif-like, naive, possessed of an innocence that becomes comical when set against the brutality and manipulations taking place around him. 
I began my conversation with Owen Horsley by asking whether Shakespeare's plays had affected Henry VI's reputation in a similar way to Richard III. I think it's really interesting. I'm a real advocate for Henry VI, I have to say. I'm, I'm, really? I'm not of the opinion that he's a, a, as simple as a weak king. I, obviously, mm. you know, they often refer to him in, in broad terms of, oh, he's a weak king. He's the one that doesn't do well as a king. Whereas I think having studied the play and gone through the play, what's really fascinating about him is that he's very consistent. Mm. Like his language is very consistent. He has a very strong belief system. And he does try very hard to get people to see the world from his point of view. So I think yeah. he's a great diplomat. He is a diplomat in a world that is basically just growing momentum in terms of its violence and its personal ambition. So it's again, it's it, it, viewing him as someone who actually wants to make and affect some kind of change. Um, he be- when he says, blessed be the peacemaker, it's like he, be- he believes that. Um, mm-hmm. And also when he talks about Cade going, we will answer with words and not blows. That's not because he's weak. That's because he views the solution in that particular way. And so I don't think that's a weakness in him. I think that's a a strength in him. It's just, unfortunately, his language is never, it's never taken on. People don't learn his language because people are too driven by personal ambition. Henry consistently calls for union. I've already referenced his first appearance where he appeals to the Duke of Gloucester and the Bishop of Winchester to join their hearts in love and amity. And later he delights in declaring peace with France and does so with the same religious feeling his father used to justify war. This peacemaking aspect of Henry's character appears to have been drawn from life. In 1458, three years into the Wars of the Roses, he organised a love day which culminated in a procession of opposed participants holding hands and walking from Westminster Palace to St Paul's Cathedral. But peace wasn't to last, and the day was heavily criticised. Sir Thomas Mallory was one who poured scorn on love days, and given that he had spent years fighting on both sides of the Civil War and was imprisoned for participating long enough to write La Morte d'Arthur, he probably had good reason to feel cynical about Henry VI's holding hands strategy. We see Henry attempt to avert the brewing divides in the Plantagenets during one of his speeches from part one. Richard Plantagenet and the Duke of Somerset have quarrelled and have asked their followers to wear a white or red rose respectively to blazon their allegiance. Henry discovers the rift after his court is relocated to France and there he delivers the following admonishment. Come hither, you that would be combatants. Henceforth I charge you, as you love our favour, quite to forget this quarrel and the cause. And you, my lords, remember where we are, in France, amongst a fickle, wavering nation. If they perceive dissension in our looks, and that within ourselves we disagree, how will their grudging stomachs be provoked to willful disobedience and rebel? Beside, what infamy will there arise when foreign princes shall be certified that for a toy, a thing of no regard, King Henry's peers and chief nobility destroyed themselves and lost the realm of France. Oh, think upon the conquest of my father, my tender years, and let us not forego that for a trifle that was bought with blood. Let me be umpire in this doubtful strife. I see no reason, if I wear this rose, that anyone should therefore be suspicious I'm more inclined to Somerset than York. Both are my kinsmen, and I love them both. As well they may upbraid me with my crown, because forsooth the King of Scots is crowned. But Your discretions better can persuade than I am able to instruct or teach. And therefore, as we hither came in peace, so let us still continue peace and love. Cousin of York, we institute your grace to be our regent in these parts of France. And good my lord of Somerset, unite your troops of horsemen with his bands of foot. And like true subjects, sons of your progenitors, go cheerfully together 
and digest your angry collar on your enemies. Ourself, my Lord Protector, and the rest, after some respite, will return to Calais, from thence to England, where I hope ere long to be presented by your victories with Charles Alençon and their traitorous rout. Henry places an unusual amount of faith in inherited nobility. You heard him there appealing to Somerset and Richard to be good subjects, good sons of your progenitors. This is despite the fact that Henry himself is walking evidence that not all qualities are hereditary. The savage stock of Henry V was supposed to breed bastard warriors when he married a French princess, but instead he and his bride created the shy, pious, peace-loving Henry VI. The true inheritor of Henry V's spirit in this play is Talbot, the terror of the French. Henry's ghost is lamented with this sort of stirring hyperbole used by and about Hotspur or the Douglas in the two parts of Henry IV. You might recall Hal's description of Hotspur as he that kills me some six or seven dozen of Scots at a breakfast, washes his hands and says to his wife, fie upon this quiet life, I want work. Now Hal himself is the one being described in such a way. His deeds, says Gloucester in part one, exceed all speech. He ne'er lift up his hand but conquered. Obviously, Henry V's play wasn't written yet, but it's interesting to read the plays in this order and see how he is remembered. The protean character we saw, the Machiavel, the modern, flexible politician, Hal to his drinking buddies, King Henry to his nation, and a little touch of Harry to his men, in death is rendered flat. He is a national champion, a symbol. Though he haunts the play, when Sir William Lucy calls Henry V that ever-living man of memory, we are forced to disagree. His memory is as cold and frozen as a bust of St George. The sort of chivalric excess Hal and Falstaff lampooned in life also figures in the character of Talbot. We hear that he strikes terror into the hearts of French children, while their fathers regard him like the devil in arms. On the field they won't even go near Talbot, such is their fear of sudden death, and the deeds surrounding stout Talbot's name are such that his jailers believe he could bend the bars of iron walls with his hands. Such was the fame of valiant Talbot that he became known as the English Achilles. But all of this must be measured against the strangely incongruous treatment Talbot receives elsewhere in the play. There is a strange discrepancy between English soldiers doting on him, the French soldiers trembling at him, and how he is received by the Countess of Auvergne. Now she is of course his enemy and trying to entrap Talbot, but that doesn't satisfactorily explain her reaction to seeing him in the flesh. What? Is this the man? Is this the scourge of France? Is this the Talbot, so much feared abroad that with his name the mothers still their babes? I see report is fabulous and false. I thought I should have seen some Hercules, a second Hector for his grim aspect, and large proportion of his strong-knit limbs. Alas, this is a child, a silly dwarf. It cannot be this weak and riddled shrimp should strike such terror to his enemies. Later, Talbot presents himself to Henry VI, and the monarch, who has heard of Talbot's accomplishments since childhood, still asks, Is this the Lord Talbot, Uncle Gloucester, that have so long been resident in France? What do we make of these reactions? Does their surprise to Talbot in the flesh indicate he is a physically untypical champion? And if he is a dwarfish sort of knight, does this reflect the reduced status of the kind of chivalry he represents? Again, remember that the romping heroes of Henry IV's day were made to look outdated, even silly. So how much more decayed is that spirit now? Perhaps we can judge by the conduct of some of Talbot's comrades. He is dismayed by the actions of a certain Sir John Fastolf, whose cowardice in fleeing battle leads to Talbot being taken prisoner. This Fastolf, as you might have guessed, provided Shakespeare with the inspiration for his later, more fat and famous knight, who he tried to distinguish from this earlier character by changing his name to Sir John Oldcastle, until Oldcastle's descendants complained. Fastolf and Talbot were both members of the famous Order of the Garter, which we have discussed in relation to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Edward III. At Henry's coronation in Paris, Talbot meets Fastolf again and tears the garter from his leg. When first this order was ordained, my lords, knights of the garter were of noble birth valiant and virtuous, full of haughty courage, such as were grown to credit by the wars, not fearing death, nor shrinking for distress, but always resolute in most extremes. And so we see that Talbot himself acknowledges that time has moved on, leaving the glory days of chivalry behind. 
Tolbert's worldview cannot account for modern phenomena like the Holy Maid leading the French troops. Reeling from his first encounter with Joan, Tolbert says, My thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I am, nor what I do. A witch by fear, not force, like Hannibal drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. So bees with smoke and doves with noisome stench are from their hives and houses driven away. We can't help but wonder what Henry V would have made of Joan and what kind of dialogue those two would have shared. Henry outgrew the old chivalric customs, but didn't forget when it was occasionally useful to invoke them. Cut off in his prime, it is easy to imagine he has inspired almost by accident this short-lived chivalric renaissance, led by the likes of Talbot. But despite appearances, the world is indeed moving on. The country is no longer run by warrior kings, but scheming dukes and bishops. From the very start of Henry VI Part I, Talbot is on the back foot. As Jane Kingsley Smith writes, Throughout the play, Talbot is placed in a series of highly claustrophobic situations, whether locked into the Countess of Auvergne's castle or surrounded by French soldiers. Seemingly, in every battle he fights against the French, he is round-encompassed, girdled, hemmed about with grim destruction. At one moment, the French close in on him in a waste of iron, and in another, like a yelping kennel. Talbot describes himself and his men as a little herd of England's timorous deer, which provides me with a little segue to a deer-related bit of Shakespeare lore. In the next scene, we meet Sir William Lucy, whose descendant, Sir Thomas Lucy, owned an estate near Stratford-upon-Avon. There has long been a tradition that a youthful Shakespeare was caught poaching on Lucy's estate and responded by writing some defamatory ballads about him. If true, he had since got over his grudge, as his ancestor is presented as an honourable man in Henry VI, part one. But anyway, back to Talbot. Surrounded by the French, his situation gets worse when his young son arrives as instructed. Oh, young John Talbot, I did send for thee to tutor thee in stratagems of war. But oh, malignant and ill-boding stars, now thou art come unto a feast of death. He implores his child to leave and save his life. But John is his father's son, and fleeing is just not the Talbot way. John stays, and both Talbots die, the elder clasping the younger, saying, My old arms are young John Talbot's grave. I just want to have a quick look at how young John persuades his father to let him stay and die by his side. It's a scene which can be difficult in performance. We've only just met young John, and his sudden appearance feels a bit like Shakespeare juicing up the tragedy, like a bullet-ridden cop gasping that he was just one day away from retirement. We might also be inclined to wonder why Talbot doesn't just put his foot down and have John dragged away to safety by his soldiers. And finally, why is the debate given in playful rhyming couplets? Here's a quick taste of how that sounds. Fly to revenge my death if I be slain. He that flies will ne'er return again. If both we stay, we both are sure to die. Then let me stay, and father, do you fly. Your loss is great, so your regard should be. My worth unknown, no loss is known in me. Shall all thy mother's hopes lie in one tomb? Aye, rather than I'll shame my mother's womb. I can only imagine that's no easy task for actors to sell on stage. But two things about this weird scene stand out to me. First off, one of young Talbot's arguments for staying and fighting is the same as Gawain's arguments for taking on the beheading game instead of King Arthur. Yes, I'm young, but that's the point. My worth is unknown. I'm not yet proven so let me have a chance. Talbot is therefore put in the position of arguing against the logic of the medieval tradition he exemplifies, and like so much other language in the play, it traps him. Secondly, the rhyme. It does seem odd, it seems misplaced, and I'm sure productions aiming for realism wish that it was in unrhymed blank verse instead. But after this theme of encirclement around Talbot, what could feel more hopeless, more inescapable, than arguing with his son in rhyme? Rhyme carries that ring of nursery taunt, that I know you are, but what am I, reflexivity. Compared with the freedom of unrhymed verse, rhyme feels terminal. Talbot's arguments will be batted away with sound, not sense. And the very fact that it sounds ludicrous also builds on the impression of a man completely out of his depth, and out of time even. All around Talbot, fresher and more fiendish innovators are rising to power. His brand of chivalry is helpless against the transgressive likes of Joan of Arc, or the new political and predatory noblemen of England? Well, I think, the, I mean, the best scene in part one has to be the one in the Rose Garden, 
Mm. Uh, because, and it's not only great because of what it sets up in terms of the plot, but it, it just it finds it finds a new level of wit and irony in the way that people engage with each other. Whereas there's, in an honor code, you're you're kind of you're taking away the irony and you're t- it becomes more earnest and it becomes more felt. And yeah. when you've got the two against each other, the chivalric honor code seems a bit ridiculous in comparison. Mm in a way you enjoy as an audience you enjoy the more kind of attacks that the men are playing also we recognize it more because it's more politics as we know it suddenly in comparison Talbot although we love him and he's holding so tightly onto a world that was a world in which he thrives it's really hard for him to engage in that you know it's hard for him to suddenly he can't just shift into that language i mean it's interesting i mean like i always kind of find lots of modern references from my sense of like how language works but I just it really just becomes so much like in the thick of it um <laughs> the language of of this play like it you know you suddenly hear that language and you imagine someone like Talbot going into against Malcolm Tucker it would just be ridiculous he wouldn't last five seconds but of course we we should lament the loss of this of Talbot because it is the end of an era and then the, the next era is it's hard it's horrible if you're enjoying what you've heard so far why not consider becoming a patron of the podcast which enables you to access exclusive bonus episodes of here read this including shows on people like raymond chandler robert louis stevenson and ovid to sign up simply visit patreon.com slash here, read this. Now, on with the show. Another history play, another standout scene in a garden. Like the garden scene in Richard II, history has very little to do with the temple garden scene in Henry VI. And in fact, though the Yorkists adopted the white rose as an emblem early on in the Civil War, the Lancastrians only adopted the red rose after the Battle of Bosworth and the crowning of Henry VII. Shakespeare's numerous sources included the old favourites Hollinshed, Hall, and Samuel Daniel's Civil Wars and in cramming 20-odd years of history into a single play, he takes plenty of liberties. For example, following the Temple Garden scene, Richard Plantagenet visits his uncle, Edmund Mortimer, who is dying imprisoned in the Tower of London. Mortimer's one appearance is vital in encouraging Richard into claiming power. He tells his nephew that their line of the family should have rightly taken the throne after Richard II, but was blocked from doing so by Henry Bolingbroke's usurpation. Mortimer tells Richard that his father was executed by Henry V for attempting to undo this wrong by killing the king and placing Mortimer on the throne instead. That part is true, but as you might recall, this is the same Mortimer, the 5th Earl of March, who revealed the plot to King Henry V and so retained his trust. He was never imprisoned and in fact was present at the trial of the conspirators. For whatever reason, Shakespeare has less mercy on him and claps him in irons. Mortimer actually died when his nephew was only 13 years old, rendering their scene even less historical. Similarly, Talbot's son was not a stripling, but in his late 20s with children of his own when he died fighting alongside his famous father. At the beginning of the play, Henry V's funeral is interrupted with news of territories being reclaimed by the French. It actually took three decades for the French to recover all their lost lands, and even within the context of the play, some of the territories listed make no sense. Peter Saccio points out that Paris is on the list, yet Henry VI is crowned there later in Act Four. But history aside, the roses play an important part in establishing one of Shakespeare's favourite themes. When Richard Plantagenet encourages the men in the Temple Garden to pick a rose, what he's aiming to do is circumvent language altogether. Since you are tongue-tied and so loath to speak, in dumb significance, proclaim your thoughts. Suppressing language is a trademark move of those wanting to take power. By getting language and its complexities out of the way, Plantagenet can force people out of a nuanced situation and into a binary one. The king recognises the arbitrariness of the rose, but fails to understand what it has been made to represent, and he shows this by chiding his nobles for arguing over a toy, a thing of no regard. Here Henry shows both wisdom and naivety. In knowing that a rose signifies nothing, that by any other name it would smell as sweet, he is wise, but he is naive in thinking he can waft away the smell Plantagenet has infused it with. This interest in semiotics is evident throughout the play. The name of Talbot, one soldier remarks, is as good as a sword. This is proved to be true later on when Talbot comes back to the mockery of the Countess of Auvergne by saying his substance isn't here, implying his body isn't here, his strength isn't here, and then it duly arrives in the form of his loyal men. 
When Talbot dies, Sir William Lucy wishes hopelessly for a similar power to weaponize himself with words when he says, Oh, were mine eyeballs into bullets turned, that I in rage might shoot them at your faces. I absolutely love the absurdity of that. And it also it recalls the throwing balls back and forth that we talked about in relation to Henry V. Once again, or perhaps for the very first time, Shakespeare expresses harmony and disorder in the very texture of his language. As we've seen throughout the history plays, when the nation is in harmony with itself, so is the universe, so is language, and so are physical bodies. Let's call these three clusters of images the cosmic, the musical, and the bodily, and use them to take the national temperature in this play. On the cosmic side of things, it's not looking good. In the very first line, we hear, Hung be the heavens with black. Heaven itself is grieving for Henry V, it appears. But this also refers to a stage practice. During Elizabethan tragedies, the stage was draped in black hangings. Bad revolting stars have consented to Henry's death, says Bedford, an indication that the universe wanted or needed Henry V dead. Charles, Dauphin of France, lets us know that the stars have switched sides, saying of Mars, Late did he shine upon the English side. Now we are victors. Upon us he smiles. Elsewhere, on the cosmic side of things, there are plenty of ill-boding prophecies. Exeter says he fears that fatal prophecy, which in the time of Henry named the fifth, was in the mouth of every sucking babe, that Henry born at Monmouth should win all, and Henry born at Windsor lose all. He also tells us Henry V himself made a prophecy, that the Bishop of Winchester, if once he came to be a cardinal, he'll make his cap co-equal with the crown. In Edward III, set at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, the French misconstrue prophecies of success and are crushed by the English. Heaven favours the right, and one nation's prophet is another nation's devil. Joan of Arc, who we'll talk more about shortly, is early on described by an Englishman as a holy prophetess new risen up, and she retains that status for as long as the French have the upper hand. By the end of the play, her supposed holiness is used to mock her. When she pleads for her life by saying she is pregnant, York and Warwick respond, now, heaven forfend, the holy maid with child, the greatest miracle that e'er ye wrought. Quite depraved for men of God, and bear in mind that when Henry welcomes peace with France, he does so on grounds of their common faith, something that has been ignored by competence for generations. On to the musical side of things, I made the point that in Richard II, the world seems to be in tune with itself. Even the gardeners speak in verse. England, before the deposition of its king, appears to be in literal harmony. Then comes the two parts of Henry IV and the great explosion of voices. Joining the stately verse of the courts is the modern prose of characters like Falstaff. In Henry V, the country is led by a king who is master of all these voices, and we hear not only from the characters of every creed, but Scottish, Welsh and Irish voices commingling for the first time. Now, parts one and three of Henry VI are like Richard II in verse. The chaos and calamity remains, but it is here represented not by a clash of prose, but by incongruous imagery and silence. Let's talk about silence first. Old Mortimer advises Richard Plantagenet, With silence, nephew, be thou politic. Strong fixed is the house of Lancaster, and like a mountain, not to be removed. We've already seen Plantagenet ask his tongue-tied followers to pick a rose, and later he describes his own unspeakable grievance. Some words there grew twixt Somerset and me, among which terms he used his lavish tongue and did upbraid me with my father's death. Which obloquy set bars before my tongue, else with the like I had requited him. As obloquy bars Richard's tongue, beauty bars the tongue of Suffolk. Having just met the future Queen Margaret, he asks himself, Hast not a tongue? Is she not here? Wilt thou be daunted at a woman's sight? Ay, beauty's princely majesty as such. Confounds the tongue and makes the senses rough. When Richard, now Duke of York, first captures Joan, he shows he respects the power of her word by commanding her, Fell banning hag, enchantress, hold thy tongue. There are numerous moments in the play where silence carries all the meaning. Joan's spirits, her unseen counsellors, abandon her in Act 5. Enter fiends, reads the stage directions. They walk and speak not, they hang their heads. All while Joan is pleading with them, oh, hold me not with silence over long. To return to an earlier question, is Talbot physically dwarfish? The answer is not in the text, and must be addressed silently by a production. So, on various counts, Shakespeare compels us into deciding whether or not to trust our ears. And the other way in which confusion is registered is in disordered jumbles of images spewing from disordered minds. After Talbot says his mind is whirled like a potter's wheel, we are then showered in clay, 
In just 11 lines, his language then encompasses witches, Hannibal, bees, doves, smoke, stench, dogs, whelps, lions, leopards, sheep, wolves, horse and oxen. It's a flood of images, as if his mind is in cataclysm and all its creatures are bolting for the same arc. Although in this case, it being a French flood, they're actually running away from an arc. Finally, what's happening on the bodily level? Well, perhaps we've got a stout and stunted knight to follow the fat one uh, in Henry IV, but the more telling references are once again made about abstract bodies. Civil dissension, says Henry, is a viperous worm that gnaws the bowels of the Commonwealth. The imagery of Henry IV conjured up at times the sense of an enormous malfunctioning gut that was fed terrible things, which excreted worse things, and seemed subject to nightmare plumbing. We recall them here, along with Henry's disastrous attempt at hand-holding, when he tells those two rumblers of the Civil War, Plantagenet and Somerset, to go cheerfully together and digest. Standing over the corpse of Talbot, Joan of Arc comments, Him that thou magnifiest with all these titles, stinking and fly-blown, lies here at our feet. Better than any other character in the play, Joan understands the ability of language to magnify. Wherever Joan's heavenly or demonic gifts come from, they are chiefly verbal. Speak, Pucelle, the Dauphin urges, enchant him with your words. Her language is sharp, pragmatic, and utterly self-assured. She isn't given the mystic bumble of a character like Glendower in Henry IV. When she lords it over the English, it is Talbot and Bedford that cry out superstitions, as she mocks them in more earthly terms. What will you do, good greybeard? Break a lance and run a tilt at death within a chair? She is the most mysterious and powerful character in the play, outwitting the leaders of her own country and her English opponents. She is also the most reviled character. I asked Hayley Backrack for a little more context on the portrayal that Anthony Quiller Couch shuddered to think was Shakespeare's. Obviously, the standout kind of take is this is an English perspective only a couple generations really after she was actually alive. And of course, the English hate her. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, now she is literally a saint. She's always depicted heroically. Mm. And it's just sort of shocking. And, you know, you just sort of lose track of the fact like, oh, yeah, obviously the English didn't like her because she was the person who helped partially drive them out of France. Mm. Um, and so it's just this really exciting sort of like, alternate view on a historical figure who whose sort of depictions now have become really sort of standard mm. um you don't get the like loser's side view of Joan of Arc very often anymore for probably good reason um so obviously that the sort of angle on her is this sort of temp dress and she's sort of like really aggressively sexualized at every turn mm. and like constantly casting aspersions on like oh yeah the virgin haha <laughs> whatever you say Joan wink wink um yeah, exactly. Yeah. And lots of plays on, they call her La Pucelle, which of course means the virgin in French, but is a play on puzzle, which was sort of slang for whore. Mm. So different editions will sort of make that more and less obvious of how they spell that word. But she's also like a really remarkable character. Uh, there's a lot of her speeches and a lot of the things she says that are however sort of negative Shakespeare and his collaborators are trying to be sort of a remarkable scenes and she's sort of a remarkable person and she the English put up a fairly pathetic resistance because obviously that's the sort of subplot that she's interacting with is on the one hand you know the French are perfidious and they have this literal whore witch mm. helping them win but on the other hand the English are a complete disarray can't stop fighting amongst each other for five minutes and shoot themselves in the foot by being so inept so mm -hmm. On the one hand, we have Joan as this like, you know, witch temptress villain, but on the other hand, she's rightfully kind of laying bare the ineptitude of the English and sort of often comes off quite well because the English are sort of too arrogant and too um, internally divided to counter her effectively. Mm. There seems to be, I mean, it's problematic to try and impress a theme, especially when you go through the, the history plays chronologically by King. But there seems mm. to be a sort of growing class crisis and neurosis as you go through from Richard II, a kind of court play. Um, mm. Very few, I mean, really one scene that features lower class characters, which is brief. And then in Henry VI, it seems like with no Hal type character, it all just goes to goes to pot. And characters in Henry <laughs> VI are new, absolutely neurotic about class. Joan, as you say, is called daughter of a shepherd. Uh, yes, yeah. Jack Cade later, son of a plasterer. Um, yes, yeah. It sort of, 
it raises the question of where um, the sympathy sort of rests, because whilst the rise of the power of, of lower classes is kind of an agent of disorder for the plays, it's done with a bit of ambivalence. Where do you think the sympathy rests and how would characters like uh, Joan of Arc and Jack Cade gone down then, do you reckon? I think that's such a great question and such a difficult question to answer. Um, I think that, yeah, as you say, there's a lot of ambivalence. I think Joan is a really, I think a lot of people find her a really frustrating character to read. And we could talk about this later, but I had a lot of debates with um, Elinka Regulian, who is the co-director of the productions of Henry VI that I worked on, and we adapted them together and debated Joan for hours between us because she really is remarkable and powerful in so many ways. And then in her last two scenes, you could just feel the writers being like, okay, we went too far. We've got to undermine this bitch. Like (laughs) we've got to do everything we can. She's pregnant with the Dauphin's child and she denounces her own father and she like lies and lies and lies. And like, you could just feel them sort of frantically (laughs) trying to like make her look as ridiculous and pathetic and awful as possible over the course of one scene. It's a guy in a wig. She's not even French. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's just everything they could think of. They're like, no, 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 don't. So you sort of feel like there's this, there's always, and you get the same with Jack Cade in a lot of ways, like for every sort of moment when you're like, hey, that guy's kind of got a good point. He turns around and does something ridiculous or absurd or unnecessarily violent mm. or like, you know, so there's this constant sort of play of like wanting to kind of resist an audience's ability to kind of sympathize with these characters. Yeah. Um, And it's just so hard to know whether that's out of knowledge that they will and a desire to undermine that, or is it the knowledge they won't and you're sort of playing to the audience's biases. Mm. Um, But I think it's, in my opinion, sort of undeniable that both Joan and Cade get moments when the things they're saying just feel unequivocally true and just right and good and that they are in moments a sort of voice of reason or a voice of something that doesn't feel kind of like a parody of a rebel or a parody of this slutty french woman Mm. on the back of that there's also this growing uh fear of well fear of female rule and sort of (laughs) equivalence between effeminacy and you know weakness and failure particularly rising Mm -hmm. through henry the sixth but it's it's all the way back in Richard II too. And the the demonization that you've talked about of Joan of Arc, you know, how crazy is it that France is being run by a woman? Um, must be a <laughs> witch, must be a whore, that kind of thing. Was it mm-hmm. at all, was it perilous at the time to suggest effeminate weakness when there was an English queen? Yeah, I mean, that's like one of the big theories that a lot of scholars have is that like, the history plays one of their main concerns is trying to sort of work through this national anxiety about having a female monarch Mm. and like just sort of figure out like what the heck is happening what does this mean and that's why you sort of get these fixations on different kinds of sort of femininity and weakness what's interesting (laughs) we'll buckle in for another tangent (laughs) is the word effeminate is one that really didn't mean the same thing then that it does now another character who gets described as effeminate is edward the fourth who is the super slutty uh, successor usurper of Henry VI, who, you know, we see him at the end of Henry VI part three, sort of like, can't keep it in his pants, you know, (laughs) he can't focus on one woman for more than five minutes. And Richard III, his brother, future Richard III, his brother complains and complains about like, he's just constantly with women. Mm. And that's where Richard III opens as well. It's he's like a lascivious love bed and, he is effeminate. That is to be the word effeminate could also mean sort of too obsessed with women, yeah. too sexualized. At the end of Richard II, we call Printal effeminate, who's certainly not a character we think of as being feminine, oh. but jumps on a horse in full armor, not sort of. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so we're sort of we're wondering like what does that word, you know, the word in that context seems to mean like he's drunk, he's slutty, and he's, you know, just a huge mess. Mm. Um, and so when we think about the word effeminate in the period, it really means something more to do with the idea that the ideal of masculinity was self-control. Mm. The thing that separates you from animals and also from women who are only slightly better than animals is the fact that you, unlike women, can control yourself. And if you can't control yourself because you're too obsessed with sex or because you're too emotional or because you're temper, you're too hot-tempered, I think there's an w- argument that Hotspur is quite effeminate because he lacks self-control yeah. patently that's effeminacy 
um, which is really interesting because it's not quite like the way we think of the word now yeah. where it's sort of like this coded, like he's gay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and so I think that's like a really key and interesting thing when you're thinking about what it means for characters to be considered effeminate in the history plays is that it's not necessarily that they are feminine in the ways that we think of it now as like, oh, Henry VI is effeminate because he's very mild and peaceful and doesn't lose his temper. Mm. It's like, well, actually, those are the things about him that are kind of masculine. He, yeah. you know, keeps himself under control and he doesn't sort of give in to the things that other characters give in to. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting. That said, I do think that there's this tension throughout the history plays between like, masculinity and femininity and I think the ways that female characters are sort of sidelined and abused yeah especially in these plays is actually really key to that anxiety the sphere of being like a woman and maybe therefore treated like a woman yeah what could be worse it reads like constant constant masculinity under threat or maybe just sort of absolutely threatened men it seems pretty obvious that Joan of Arc objectively is meant to be quite a well attractive figure in a, a appealing leader but also mm -hmm. beautiful. And yet yeah. it's there's an awful lot of scorn and sort of a schoolboyish like, oh, she's gross, she's disgusting. You know, yes. she makes yeah. me sick. We don't like her. We don't like her at yeah, all. Yeah. She's not fit in the slightest. You know, it's that really a, <laughs> a sense of that all the way through from the English. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and that's, you know, I think uh, Joan gets compared to Deborah and Estrella, mm. who are these sort of, Deborah is from the Bible. Estrella is the sort of Greek figure of sort of truth and other things that have also gone <laughs> from my mind. <laughs> um, these are figures that Queen Elizabeth sort of allegorically associated herself with in her sort of like epic myth-making structures. And so there do sort of seem to be these ideas of like, there's this ambivalence around Joan and her sort of Elizabeth-ishness. Yeah. But then again, she's very not a virgin in this uh, world. And obviously there's no way that there is no way that they made her seem like Elizabeth because that play would have gotten shut down so fast. Mm. But there is sort of something in the ambivalence of Joan is this sort of like, we like Elizabeth, but we also are kind of threatened by Elizabeth and she makes us feel weird. Like yeah. that's sort of the feeling you get about Joan. It's like, she's really cool, but also she makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Throw stuff at her. Yeah, exactly. That's the answer. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a, there's a sort of tradition of scholarship of feeling like the sort of anxieties about masculinity that I think are just like, the, it's so to a certain extent the sort of beating heart of the history plays all the men are just terrified they have tiny dicks or something yeah. and that's why everything happens is about perhaps this sort of sense of confusion and for men anyway lack of sort of sense of who are you when your monarch is a king and if every english person is the king on some level if you are a woman what does that mean mm. what has happened to you and your identity yeah but then again you know we also have a series of plays that are about people who are terrible leaders mm. so it's not really like they're making the positive case for like kings as opposed to queens no exactly but I think, you know, Elizabeth was broadly liked for most of her reign, obviously. So I think, you know, it's easy, it's feelings about her vacillated. And but it, yeah, I think it's hard to make any sort of straightforward one to one case of like people didn't like Elizabeth. And therefore, they wanted to see history plays about when we had good kings or something like that. Young John Talbot is called by his father a son of chivalry. Chivalry, it seems, is an inherited virtue, making it all the more noticeable that it seems to be lacking in the king. The descriptions of Henry as effeminate and its contrast with the ever-living memory of his heroic father encourage the sense of an opposition between chivalry and effeminacy. This opposition seems to have been on the mind of Shakespeare's contemporaries. One of them, Thomas Nash, in his appraisal of the play featuring Brave Talbot, writes that Our forefathers' valiant acts, that have lain long buried in rusty brass and worm-eaten books, are revived, and they themselves raised from the grave of oblivion, and brought to plead their aged honours in open presence. What can be sharper reproof to these degenerate, effeminate days of ours? In Henry V, aggressive masculinity on the English side faced off against exaggeratedly effeminate Frenchmen, and the same appears to be happening here. After Joan's victory at Orleans, Alençon celebrates saying, All France will be replete with mirth and joy when they shall hear how we have played the men. As Phyllis Rackin comments, The very terms in which Alençon exults identify French manhood as play-acting. And speaking of play acting, chivalry is also made ridiculous, and it too may have contemporary relevance. Jane Kingsley Smith tells us that when Joan pours scorn on Talbot's challenge to single combat at Rouen, 
she may well have ventriloquised Queen Elizabeth's well-known impatience with her royal favourite Essex's chivalric pretensions. This was a man who had recently ridden 100 miles across enemy-occupied France, dressed in tangerine-coloured velvet, to dine with Henry of Navarre, without managing to secure any money or assistance from him. Critics have tended to recoil from the cruel treatment of Joan in her final scenes. Plenty of characters are executed in the history plays, some with dignity, others with relish. Before Joan is sent to the stake, Richard Plantagenet brings her out to meet a shepherd, ostensibly her father. He is another silent question of the play. Credited only as a shepherd, it is up for a production to decide whether or not he is really Joan's father, or simply a stranger hired by Richard to taunt her with. Either way, when Joan spurns him, he is fairly quick to turn on her, shouting, Burn her! Burn her! Hanging is too good! This is unusually brutal, even for a pretend father, but according to Robert B. Pierce, to an Elizabethan the stage picture of a daughter refusing to kneel for her father's blessing goes beyond comedy. It is a terrible image of disorder. But Joan is resolute. She is descended from gentler stock, and she will have her captors realise it. First, let me tell you whom you have condemned. Not me begotten of a shepherd's swain, but issued from the progeny of kings, virtuous and holy, chosen from above by inspiration of celestial grace to work exceeding miracles on earth. I never had to do with wicked spirits, but you, that are polluted with your lusts, stained with the guiltless blood of innocence, corrupt and tainted with a thousand vices, because you want the grace that others have. You judge it straight a thing impossible to compass wonders, but by help of devils. No, misconceived. Joan of Arc hath been a virgin from her tender infancy, chaste and immaculate in very thought whose maiden blood, thus rigorously effused, will cry for vengeance at the gates of heaven. After doubling down on her holiness and virginity, Joan then claims to be pregnant, before finally being dragged away, cursing her captors. But she is only the first of two French women to dominate these plays, and she is captured in the scene directly before Margaret of Anjou captivates Suffolk. He aims to acquire a hand for his master, King Henry VI, but after their first meeting, he wishes he could have her for himself. Tina Packer writes that Suffolk's soliloquy on the battlefield is possibly the first time a soliloquy was used to follow the development of an idea for the audience to ponder on with the character. As we will see in the following plays, Margaret will carry on a spark of Joan, even if we never saw them meet. Phyllis Rackin writes, Whichever play came first, the two wicked French women are connected not only by the similarity of their roles and characterizations, but also by the unhistorical but emblematic scene in which Margaret is first introduced, which Shakespeare placed at the very moment when Joan is about to leave the stage of history, led off by York to captivity and the stake. The stage directions show how closely the two actions were joined. Exeunt, York and Joan is followed by a brief alarm, then comes Enter Suffolk with Margaret in his hand. Suffolk returns to England and, inspired by his own infatuation, describes the Lady Margaret to King Henry. It has immediate effect, and the king responds with a sharp dissension in his breast, commanding Suffolk back to France to agree to any covenants and procure that Lady Margaret to cross the seas to England and be crowned King Henry's faithful and anointed queen, after which he pleads to his uncle to excuse this sudden execution of his will. But of course, Henry is being manipulated. Now it is Suffolk's turn to enchant with words, and he has done so superbly. Henry isn't executing his own will at all, but once again is being told what to do by his underlings. Suffolk is left on stage to set up part two with a villainous aside, and so a play that opened with thunder ends on a rather wet and weak final line. Thus Suffolk hath prevailed, and thus he goes, as did the youthful Paris once to Greece, with hope to find the like event in love, but prosper better than the Trojan did. Margaret shall now be queen and rule the king, but I will rule both her, the king, and realm. Both her, the king, and realm. It's just never sounded quite right to me, but there we go. That's the end of the play, and that is the end of the episode as well. I really hope you uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you so much to my um, my guests. It's really, really exciting to have a kind of team on an episode. 
and uh, a team for a, a series of episodes as well. Haley and Owen will be back on part two and part three, as will Danielle, um, delivering more of those terrific readings. Um, and there will be interviews with Owen and Haley uh, coming out in between the episodes on uh, each play in the trilogy. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do all the usual um, stuff, you know, the drill, subscribing and all of that. Um, I'll be back soon with part two of Henry VI. And uh, until then, happy reading. <laughs>